Okay, it looks like it's pretty close to leveling out for our participants. Fantastic, huge audience today. It looks like maybe the largest ever. I would like to officially welcome everyone today to another installment in Sinobiological's hosted and sponsored BioTalk Tuesdays webinar series. We always have a world-renowned researcher in cutting edge technology and research to talk about during our BioTalk Tuesday seminars. So I'm Rob Burgess, I head up business development for Sinobiological and it's my honor to host once again, BioTalk Tuesday. I'll just mention one very brief housekeeping issue, and that is I would ask our participants to ask any questions that they may have in the chat box. And then at the conclusion of the seminar by our guest speaker, I will run through those and get to as many of those questions verbally as I can with the speaker. And so we'll try to run through those, see if we can get most of them answered. So again, please just ask your questions in the chat box and I'll get to at the end. Also, I ask everybody to just reach out in the chat box and say your name and where you're from. We're always delighted to find out worldwide where everybody is chiming in from for our seminar. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce our renowned guest speaker. This is Dr. Deborah Fuller and Dr. Fuller is a professor in the Department of Microbiology at the University of Washington. And she is Associate Director of Research at the Washington National Primate Research Center. Dr. Fuller has authored over 100 manuscripts and is the co-inventor on over a dozen patents and is also co-founder of Orlance Incorporated. Orlance is a biotech company that's developing a needle-free nucleic acid vaccine delivery platform. Dr. Fuller also has served on several NIH study sections and the leadership team for NIH's COVID-19 Vaccines and Therapeutics Evaluation Network. Most recent honors for Dr. Fuller include the Hope College Distinguished Alumni Award in 2021, as well as the Latinx Faculty Excellence in Research Award just last year. So Dr. Fuller, it's an honor and privilege to have you today, and I know the title of your talk, I forgot to say it, it is Nucleic Acid Vaccines, the Beginning of a Medical Revolution. Thank you for your time today, and I will turn the screen over to you now. Great, thank you for that introduction, and it's truly my pleasure to be here today and to talk to you about uh, nucleic acid vaccines. Uh, let me just get my screen up here. And we will go to presentation mode here. Give me a second. It takes a minute for my big screen to warm up here. So, but uh, uh, yeah, so I want, you know, this is a, this is a, of course a, a labor of love here for nucleic acid vaccines. I've been working in this area for over 30 years. Uh, and of course with the COVID-19 um, pandemic, it really brought nucleic acid vaccines to the forefront. So let's just get started here. Um, I do have some disclosures. As uh, um, uh, Rob mentioned, I am a co-founder of Orlance. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of their technology. I also serve as a scientific advisor for HDT Bio, and I'll uh, be highlight highlighting a little bit of their technology today too. So I, I always like to say that uh, developing a vaccine was uh, a turning point for COVID-19, but, but really COVID-19 was also a, a major turning point for mRNA vaccines in a similar way that we can see a turning point that happened, uh, you know, with the, the meteor hit of the dinosaurs. Often I, I think of it that way, that there was, there was sort of a, uh, a major event and then, uh, you know, what's coming forward now is really a revolution, I think, in, in, uh, in, uh, in medical uh, research. And so I think of nucleic acid vaccines, as I said, as a revolution in modern medicine, not just because of its ability to uh, slow and eventually stop this COVID-19 pandemic, but because from uh, mRNA vaccines, um, uh, we are, are on the verge of seeing uh, medical breakthroughs in a wide variety of different areas, including cancers, uh, other infectious diseases, genetic diseases, and the like. And we'll cover a little bit of, of, of that in this, um, in this lecture here today. 
So at first, let's kind of back up a little bit because most of you probably became familiar with mRNA vaccines with the COVID-19 vaccines. And what really uh, is highlighted about the mRNA vaccines is how incredibly effective they were, but also how quick they were to develop. This was the first vaccines to ever be developed in less than a year. It's a record time. Before that, the fastest vaccine to ever be developed took four years. Uh, and so not only were they fast, but they were a really very high efficacy, 94 to 95% efficacy, considerably better than what you see with many other types of vaccines that were in development at the time. And so this was really important. And to date, mRNA vaccines serve as one of the most potent strategies to slow and what we anticipate to eventually stop the COVID-19 pandemic. And in many respects, COVID-19 uh, meeting mRNA was really a perfect storm. It wasn't that mRNA was invented as a result of COVID-19. This was a technology well underway in terms of development. It was really a perfect storm uh, of mRNA being the right technology ready at the right time to stop a pandemic. Um, it, you know, as I mentioned, it had unprecedented speed. We, we had always known it, during even the earliest stages of nucleic acid vaccine discovery and innovation, we'd always thought of them as potentially the type of vaccine that could uh, potentially stop an emerging pandemic. And COVID-19 really uh, was a proving ground for that. Within three months uh, of the uh, emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there were already clinical trials uh, in progress. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, these mRNA vaccines proved to have superior potency over any of the other vaccine strategies that were emerging at the time. And, and even as we see more variants emerging, the mRNA vaccines are still holding their own. While we see breakthrough infections, what's important is that to understand that vaccines are really designed to protect us from disease. And we still see these vaccines are holding their own and protecting us from severe disease when you compare it to individuals who are not vaccinated. And so I really want to kind of back up a little bit and kind of get a little bit in the history of nucleic acid vaccines. I also want to emphasize that while uh, mRNA vaccines are sort of on the world stage there in the forefront of everybody's mind, I'm going to, when I talk about nucleic acid vaccines, I'm referring to both mRNA as well as DNA vaccines. Both of these technologies are advancing uh, forward and hopes considerable potential uh, for other medical breakthroughs in the near future. And so let's just cover again what are mRNA vaccines. I think most of you know what these are, but just uh, just to kind of back up a little bit and, and remind ourselves of where we're at. So uh, obviously mRNA is transcribed from DNA and it's this mRNA that uh, is a codes for a vaccine antigen, in this case, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And so that mRNA though is typically unstable and it has to be encapsulated into a lipid nanoparticle. This lab, lipid nanoparticle not only stabilizes the mRNA, but also enables a fusion of that lipid nanoparticle to our own uh, cells dumping the mRNA inside our cells. Once inside the cell, then that mRNA can be just transcribed to produce uh, the antigen. So in a sense, the mRNA vaccines change our bodies in, sort, in a sort of factory uh, for producing vaccines. And once the antigen is produced, then you can make an immune response, in this case, an antibody response, which protects us from infection. So DNA vaccines differ a bit for mRNA. They're really the same idea in the sense that we're turning our cells into our, into our own vaccine factories producing vaccines, but they differ in the sense that with DNA, uh, they actually uh, is sort of a step ahead of the mRNA. When the DNA vaccine goes in, uh, inside the cell, it actually has to then get to the nucleus as well, where it can then transcribe the mRNA, and then it kind of all works the same way. And just to emphasize, there is a DNA vaccine licensed for COVID-19 uh, called, called Psychodeed. It was first uh, licensed in India. And so we have both mRNA and DNA vaccines now licensed for human use. One of the uh, potential advantages of DNA vaccines is that they're stable at room temperature, they are faster produced because you don't have to transcribe them into mRNA. Uh, they uh, have cost-effective scale-up with uh, less infrastructure. Uh, we'll talk about this in a minute, but they're very effective in inducing T-cell responses, and they also have very low reactogenicity. A drawback of DNA vaccines is that they're less immunogenic than mRNA vaccines, and that's why mRNA vaccines were really the first to emerge in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Um, but there are some similarities between RNA and DNA vaccines. They both are capable of inducing two important immune defenses that uniquely contribute to protection from infection and disease, including COVID-19. Of course, we're all familiar with antibodies. Antibodies function to block the virus from infecting the cell. Uh, those are neutralizing antibody, but they also can uh, uh, encapsulate or co coat a uh, pathogen and uh, uh, stimulate uh, immune cells such as this macrophage to recognize that this is a foreign uh, entity and to uh, engulf that and then um, eliminate that from the body. These are <clears throat> non-neutralizing antibody. They still decorate the, the virus, but uh, they don't uh, prevent it from infecting the cell per se. <clears throat> the other component, which is very important for DNA and RNA vaccines that we'll talk about is T cell responses. So T cell responses, which are both CD4 and CD8 positive T cells play an important role in facilitating the development of antibodies. That's for the CD4s, but there's also a CD8 positive T cell called a cytotoxic T cell that can find and kill cells uh, that become infected. So let's say the antibody fails to prevent the infection and that virus gets inside our cell. Now these T cells can actually identify uh, those infected cells and eliminate those from our body. We think the combination of these immune mechanisms are probably why RNA as well as DNA vaccines are still holding out in terms of protecting us from disease. Because even if we become infected, say with a new variant, we have other immune mechanisms that can very quickly clear that pathogen from our bodies, preventing us from getting severe disease and hospitalization. <clears throat> so what are <clears throat> the key differences between DNA and RNA? They certainly both use genetic material, both DNA or mRNA, but they use different genetic material, obviously. As I mentioned, they both induce antibody and T cell responses. I'll show you a little bit of data to indicate that they are different in the types of responses that they induce. mRNA tends to be much better than DNA inducing strong antibody responses, but DNA may be the superior method to induce T cell responses. Um, you do need a delivery platform of some sort to get into the cells. If you just dump these uh, nucleic acid vaccines and inject them directly in the body, they just go into extracellular spaces they become degraded and they're not very efficient. Uh, for DNA, it has to get inside uh, the nucleus uh, to be able to, um, to uh, a tra be transcribed and produce protein. And as I mentioned, for mRNA, it just has to get into the cytoplasm. So it holds uh, a significant advantage in that regard. Um, but we still need a, some sort of delivery vehicle to be able to get it inside the cells. Um, both of them can be developed very fast or easy and they're cheap to produce in large scale. DNA might hold a little bit of an edge here though, because it is stable at room temperature, as you may have heard with mRNA vaccines, they require minus 80 uh, um, storage. And so that can uh, uh, potentially uh, form a barrier for uh, worldwide distribution. Whereas DNA has a greater potential for worldwide distribution because of stability. It's also faster and cheaper to produce uh, in large scale because you don't have to uh, make the mRNA after making the DNA, the DNA just goes directly into the body. And so here's an example of a study we did in our lab to really kind of compare both DNA and mRNA vaccines. And what we find is that they may induce distinct immune responses. So this is just a marker antigen. Um, we're looking at antibody responses on the left-hand side and gamma interferon T cell responses on the right-hand side. Uh, supercore just means supercore DNA. And so you see a comparison of mRNA formulated in lipid nanoparticle induces much stronger antibody responses than DNA vaccines injected IM or with a gene gun. And then if you flip over here on the gamma interferon T cell responses, you see that the, uh, the RNA, the lipid nanoparticle, you know, induces a very, very modest T cell response, but compared to DNA delivered IM or with a gene gun that induces much stronger T cell response. So there can be sort of differences in how these uh, different types of uh, uh, nucleic acid vaccines induce immune responses. But let's take this a step further and understand a little bit how DNA and mRNA vaccines differ from our more traditional and viral vector vaccines. Now, before COVID, this was the types of vaccines that we had, either a weakened virus called a live attenuated vaccine, a dead virus or inactivated vaccine, or small parts of the uh, virus that are produced in the lab and then injected into the body. And these are called recombinant protein vaccines. They have their, their drawbacks. Uh, live attenuated vaccines can be less safe. Often inactivated vaccines, and this is what we saw certainly with COVID-19, are less effective. And then uh, recombinant protein vaccines are very, very effective, uh, but they're very slow to develop just because of the need to uh, purify and produce these uh, in the lab. 
Um, the other type of vaccine that emerged concurrently with the mRNA vaccines is a viral vectored vaccines. This is actually works in principle, very similar mRNA and DNA vaccines in the sense that you're trying to get uh, uh, genetic material into the cell and then instruct that cell to produce the, uh, the vaccine antigen. But it differs in the sense that it uses a virus actually to deliver that genetic material. And that can be very, very efficient. One of the potential drawbacks though is that your body is gonna make an immune response not only against the protein encoded by that genetic material, but also starts to make an immune response against that virus that is carrying that genetic material into the cell. And so over time, if you want to continue to use this particular type of viral vector vaccine for additional booster immunizations or updates, you'll start to generate immunity against the viral vector, and that can limit its effectiveness in delivering that genetic material to the, to the cell. Uh, DNA and RNA vaccines don't have that issue. And so for both mRNA and DNA vaccines, um, the in vivo production does mimic live attenuated vaccines, but without the risk, and they're faster to make, they're safer than traditional vaccines, and they're more effective, and they don't have the issue of potentially inducing immunity against the, uh, the carrier. And so just to kind of summarize here the differences between nucleic acid vaccines and traditional vaccines, we're talking about both mRNA as well as DNA is sort of the blueprint of the protein, uh, whereas for traditional vaccines, you actually have to get a protein or an activated microbe. Production is a lot faster because all you need is the genetic code to create these vaccines, whereas production is much slower with traditional vaccines because you have to uh, identify the protein and then purify that uh, in the lab. So both the process and the production can be much slower with traditional vaccines. And so, um, you know, as I want to emphasize is that, you know, it, uh, mRNA and DNA vaccines were not invented at the start of COVID-19. And that's when, when most people became aware of them, um, but they were well in production for, or for many years prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, and it really did start in the 1950s with the discovery of DNA and mRNA, uh, uh, and, but it was really in the 1990s where the discovery, we discovered that the injection of DNA or mRNA could induce immune responses in animals. And that was the first clue we had that this might be a whole new class of vaccines. Now, it took about six years before the first DNA, and mRNA was not very quick to the table because it was very unstable, but DNA vaccines were actually the first ones to enter into human clinical trials for both cancer and infectious diseases. Unfortunately, these first clinical trials, um, the DNA vaccines were poorly immunogenic, uh, and they were not very successful. And it took several years later before we could develop strategies that I'll talk about in a little bit to make DNA vaccines more immunogenic so that they can induce protective levels of immunity in human. We're still talking about DNA here now, even in 2009, uh, where the first uh, DNA vaccines for cancer was developed and shown to be effective in humans. It wasn't until about 2010 that we start to see mRNA vaccines enter into human trials is for primarily for cancer. And that really was uh, due to the development of lipid nanoparticles that were able to protect the mRNA and make them more immunogenic uh, or uh, stable for delivery. And so, of course, we saw in 20... Okay, did you guys lose me? Hey, Christine. I'm sorry. Hey, Deborah. Yeah, we lost you for just a minute. We had you back. Okay, do you still see my slides? No, can you reshare them, please? Okay. Not sure what happened there. Yeah, so no worries. let's see. It happens. No big deal. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm not sure where did, where did you guys lose me? <clears throat> Uh, maybe a one minute ago would be my guess of your accident. Okay. So you were half through slide 17, I think. Slide, oh, 17. Okay. So I did get to slide 17. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Kentucky. So I heard a lot about the history there in slide 17. Oh, okay, great. So you already heard that. So just to emphasize that DNA and RNA vaccines have been uh, in development for over 30 years. And the first DNA and RNA vaccines were actually started, uh, tested in humans uh, over 20 years ago. So we know they're very safe and they're very effective. So just uh, so um, there were some major opticos uh, that impeded the early development of mRNA vaccines this is why we didn't see them until maybe five years ago. Um, for DNA, as I mentioned, um, there was inefficient delivery directly in the cells, and they also were poorly immunogenic. For mRNA, the biggest obstacles for early development was inefficient delivery in the cells high reactogenicity and instability. And so uh, key innovations that really made the mRNA vaccines work in humans was to develop nucleoside modified mRNA to both increase the protein expression and control the immunogenicity because without this nucleoside modification, mRNA would be too reactogenic, causing too much inflammation, which is not something you want. For a good uh, vaccine immune response, you need a good balance between uh, inducing immune responses without causing too much uh, reactogenicity. These lipid nanoparticles were also essential for the success of mRNA vaccines, because if they just get delivered in the extracellular spaces, they're just gonna degrade. And so the lipid nanoparticles protect, protected the RNA, made them more stable, and then facilitated their entry into cells as well. There were also key innovations that made DNA vaccines work uh, in humans. One was the advent of genetic adjuvants. So DNA inherently is not as immunogenic as mRNA. The, the cells don't sense it as, as efficiently. And so what happened was the development of additional plasmas that get co-delivered with DNA that uh, trigger uh, innate immune responses and innate immune act activation in the cells. And that helped to make DNA vaccines much more immunogenic. The other was the development of efficient delivery technologies, not lipid nanoparticles per se, but actually more physical methods of delivering DNA uh, into cells. Uh, this like includes a, a gene gun, which we'll talk about, but also electroporation, which is basically injects the DNA into the muscle and then stimulates an electrical pulse that opens up the uh, cells so that the uh, uh, DNA can get into those cells. These technologies really made a difference for making uh, DNA vaccines work well in humans. And so the success of the COVID-19 vaccines have really all opened up hope that we can develop new nucleic acid uh, vaccines, DNA or RNA, uh, for other infectious diseases or improve upon existing vaccines. You see here a bunch of different viruses and a, and a parasite, malaria parasite, in which we have very robust and active programs going on in terms of developing DNA or RNA vaccines for, for these viruses. There's others that I list down here. Uh, the list goes on. Uh, it's sort of considered almost a new era of vaccinology as many companies are now racing to develop both mRNA or DNA vaccines for infectious diseases. This is just kind of a summary of some of uh, the groups that are working on, on that and the different types of platforms they're using, the different types of vaccines that are under development and the major players who are, are developing these types of vaccines. There's also a big push and an interest in developing nucleic acid vaccines uh, for curing chronic infections and cancer. So how does this work? Let's go back to that cytotoxic T cell. I told you about that mRNA and DNA vaccines are very effective in inducing. They can identify an infected cell and eliminate that and kill that. Well, we can leverage that, uh, that capability for actually targeting chronic infections such as HIV, hepatitis B, HSV. And in this case, what we do is uh, induce that T cell response to recognize and find a chronically infected cell and then uh, eliminate that from our body. Uh, in, in a similar fashion, we can uh, think about potentially eliminating tumors. DNA and RNA vaccines are now being developed uh, to induce immunity against uh, cancer antigens, which are generally poorly, poorly seen by our bodies. But if we can stimulate immune responses against them, we can actually eliminate these tumors. A good example is uh, a vaccine that vaccines that are being developed for cervical cancer have uh, actually demonstrated efficacy uh, in human trials with uh, DNA as well as mRNA vaccine. Now here you can just see all kinds of groups working, uh, major players work on a variety of different uh, cancer vaccines that are based on either mRNA or our DNA vaccine technologies. And so what's next? Uh, what is the future for nucleic acid vaccines? 
Um, and so I kind of want to hone in on some innovations that we are, we and others are looking at that could make DNA and mRNA vaccines work even better. And these are include improved uh, lipid nanocarriers, uh, a concept called self-amplifying RNA vaccines, and uh, actually delivering DNA and RNA vaccines into the skin. And so let's, let's cover these uh, separately. There's a lot of different groups working on different lipid nanoparticles uh, that might improve over the current lipid nanoparticles. So one of the big issues with the current lipid nanoparticles is that they do require that minus 80 storage, and that has impeded worldwide distribution of mRNA vaccines. So this is a, a company that I uh, collaborate with called HDT Bio, has developed uh, a lipid inorganic nanoparticle. And it differs uh, quite a bit from uh, your regular lipid nanoparticle in, in, in several different ways. Uh, first, the RNA, actually, uh, traditional lipid nanoparticles, the RNA gets encapsulated inside the particle. And that's then in this formulation, it has to be frozen at minus 80 to, to maintain its stability. Um, where this, this particular nanoparticle differs is that the RNA actually gets coated on the outside of the lipid nanoparticle. Um, it also doesn't use certain components like cholesterol, which are limited supply worldwide, so you're not um, you know, limited by the production. And importantly, it's much more stable. It has a longer shelf life. Uh, this particular nanoparticle can be room temperature stable for three weeks, and it can be stored at 40 degrees indefinitely. So whereas uh, lipid nanoparticles formulate with the RNA encapsulated, uh, have to be undergo deep freeze. And once thawed, uh, they have to be used within hours or, or you end up use, uh, losing it. So um, the other part of this uh, technology is the use of self-amplifying or replicant uh, RNA vaccines. Uh, the way this works is they're very similar to mRNA vaccines, but they're different in the sense that uh, self-amplifying RNA vaccines in include uh, encode an additional uh, protein called replicase, which instructs that RNA, once it gets inside the cell, to make additional copies of itself. And once you make more copies of itself, you get more vaccine antigen, and more vaccine antigen makes this uh, makes uh, higher immune responses with lower doses. In addition, this sort of um, process of, of uh, making additional copies of itself uh, increases the immunogenicity of the RNA vaccine. So uh, there's uh, some potential hope that uh, self-amplifying RNA vaccines might work in a single shot. They might be more effective in the immune compromise or elderly. They might be able to induce more durable immunity. And the last piece, as I mentioned, is, is work at much lower doses. So there's a number of groups, including my group, that has been working on this. There's other uses because it actually prolongs uh, the expression of the protein. It might be actually useful for in vivo expression of monoclonal antibodies as well. And so here's an example of one of the studies that we did, uh, which uses that lion uh, lipid nanoparticle uh, formulated with a self-amplifying RNA vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. And early in our uh, research with this, we found that it was very immunogenic at both low doses at one microgram or 10 microgram doses. And it worked very effectively, not only in young mice, but also very old mice. Uh, here you see, we do have to administer two doses to get it to work well at low doses with uh, in aged mice. But you see at the higher dose, we can get very robust immunogenicity, uh, even with a single shot in, in aged mice, suggesting that self-amplifying RNA vaccines may be more effective in the elderly and may work at much lower doses. And so here's an, uh, we took this act to vaccine forward uh, during COVID-19 uh, to investigate its immunogenicity and efficacy in a preclinical non-human primate model. And this is a study that we did uh, doing sort of a dose escalation between five micrograms to 50 microgram doses. Uh, this was sort of a staggered study that we did where we uh, were enrolling animals as they became available. And so what you see is that for the 50 microgram dose, they were primed and boosted, and we waited 30 weeks to challenge the animals. For the 25 microgram dose, we uh, gave a primary immunization, and then we waited uh, in nearly 20 weeks before we gave them a booster immunization, then challenged them 11 weeks after, and then the five microgram uh, dose was the last group we enrolled, and they were primed and boosted uh, fairly close together, and then challenged only five weeks apart. So what this gave us an opportunity is look at different doses, different immunization regimens, and challenging at different time points to understand uh, the durability of that immunity. And we looked at antibody as well as T cell responses in these animals. And here's some of the data that you can see here is that what we ended up finding was that the binding antibody, there was really eventually no difference. So you can see we these are two doses administered to each of the groups. 
uh, the different dosing groups. And you can see that the level of binding antibody by the after the second dose ended up being comparable in all of the animals. And what's notable here is a binding antibody was quite durable. Here, this animal got its dose here, but you can see very sustained uh, binding antibody. This was not necessarily true for the neutralizing antibody. Uh, so that's kind of interesting in the sense that the neutralizing antibody would get a uh, peak shortly after the immunization, but then it would wane. And then if you come back with a booster immunization, it would uh, go back up. And the most interesting is that this 25 microgram group that had a longer spacing between the doses, you can see much more robust boosting in those neutralizing antibody responses. And we saw the same sort of effect with the T cell responses in this group. What's important is that when we challenge these animals, we challenge them at a time point when we had a, a group of animals that have very robust antibody T cell responses, a group that have modest antibody T cell response, and a group here in the purple that had gotten boosted uh, nearly 20, 24 weeks ago that had no detectable antibody or T cell responses at the time that they were challenged. When we look at the challenge outcome, though, you can see that all three groups were very effectively protected from uh, viruses in the lung and from clinical disease, with the most effective protection in the group uh, that ended up having the, the longer spacing between it and the robust antibody and T cell responses at the time of the challenge. But it's notable that even this 50 microgram group that had no detectable antibody or T cell responses at the time of challenge also had significant protection from clinical disease as well as viremia. Uh, and so even, we, overall, this was really comparable protection, uh, even with undetectable levels of, uh, of immune responses, indicating uh, very durable uh, immunity induced by these vaccines. Um, and so uh, what we, and I don't, I haven't shown the data here, but what we end up finding is that this uh, durable immunity in, in many respects has a lot to do with a very rapid recall response that happens. So once we expose the animals to the virus, we had a very rapid recall at antibodies as well as T cell responses. And we believe that is what played a significant role in protection uh, among all groups, regardless of the level of antibody or T cell that they had at the time of challenge. And so this is kind of a summary of this particular uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Um, you know, the mRNA vaccines took only a year to develop and get uh, licensed for use. This one took two years because we were starting, you know, more at a starting block here because there hadn't been a self-amplifying RNA vaccine developed, uh, you know, in, in clinical trials before. But you can see very quickly this was developed. And in June of 2022, this uh, vaccine became became licensed uh, for emergency use in India, becoming the first self-amplifying self RNA vaccine license for human use. And so I'm going to turn the tables here a little bit. We're going to talk about a different technology. We're going to talk about the gene gun, which is another way of getting RNA and DNA into cells. And so the gene gun works uh, by using one micron Go particles to microinject DNA or RNA uh, into the skin. And so you can kind of see an electromicrograph of, of particles here, Go particles for, uh, with uh, DNA actually coded on these Go particles. That's sort of that uh, goopy looking stuff there, but that's just precipitated DNA on them. Um, these particular particles are stable at room temperature, and so it can support worldwide distribution. And this goes for both mRNA as well as the DNA uh, when it's once it's lyophilized. Now we use a gene gun here, and this is just showing my research grade one that we use in the lab uh, to use a helium gas. When we press the trigger on this gene gun, it accelerates helium gas. Uh, into a little cartridge that's coated with these gold particles, accelerates those particles at supersonic speed into the skin. This is a needle-free de delivery, so it has potential in the future for self-administration. And this is what it looks like when it goes in the skin. You can see the particles in the epidermis. Uh, these are micron-sized particles, so they are pain-free. Uh, they don't hurt, just feels like a puff of air going in the skin. And so, you know, being pain-free, it has potential for improved compliance uh, and potential to improve coverage in the population. And so just to kind of cover this a little bit more specifically, the gene gun delivers nucleic acid vaccines directly into the cells of the epidermis. It's not an intradermal delivery, it's an epidermal delivery, You're targeting this epidermis here. And that's important because the epidermis is where there's a lot of immune competent cells capable of uh, you know, being transfected with the gene gun uh, delivered particles and inducing immune response. And this is very much in contrast to intramuscular delivery. Uh, the muscle, if you think about it, is not really an immune competent organ. Uh, yet yeah, it's where we put most of our vaccines. Our skin is our first defense against pathogens, and it really uh, is chock full of antigen presenting cells uh, and a robust immune compartment to induce immune responses. So this shows just basically Basically, uh, gene expression, the epidermis following gene gun delivery. There's that picture again showing where the particles are localized, primarily in the epidermis. Once they get inside there, the particles that get 
uh, transfect antigen presenting cells that you see here. The DNA comes off the gold particle. It gets to the nucleus. It's transcribed in the uh, to RNA, and then it uh, produces a protein uh, and induces immune responses. Um, and so uh, we have actually developed uh, collaboration with Orlands has developed now a clinical gene gun, um, uh, and we've also developed a go particle formulation that, that enables, and we now call this gene gun a Mach one uh, device to deliver both DNA as well as RNA. So on the left hand side, this is an in vitro culture showing gene gun delivery in vitro uh, of DNA versus RNA. Of course, what you see immediately uh, of this green fluorescent protein is that you see many more cells expressing the RNA and the DNA. That makes sense if you remember that RNA only has to get in the cytoplasm, whereas the DNA has to uh, find its way into the nucleus. So we have fewer cells expressing uh, than with RNA. And that actually in a single immunization with a SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, DNA, DNA or RNA vaccines delivered by gene gun, you can see that the gene gun delivered RNA vaccine induced stronger immune responses than the gene gun delivered DNA uh, vaccine. Uh, and so what's important here is that these are lyophilized formulations. So they're dry, there's DNA or RNA precipitate and gold beads, and it can be stable at room temperature for over uh, six months. We are still evaluating how long RNA and gold particle stability uh, occurs, but we anticipate that would be uh, quite stable as well. So here's a study that we took our gene gun forward into non-human primates in a preclinical study uh, to investigate immunogenicity of DNA versus self-amplifying RNA vaccine delivered by gene gun, either DNA or RNA, compared to our replicon RNA uh, delivered with that lipid nanoparticle injected intramuscular. Uh, and so this is a study which you can strikingly see here. This is the antibody responses in these uh, macaques against the original spike protein as well as a variant, the Delta variant. And what you see immediately is that this replicon RNA forming of the lipid nanoparticles after single immunization induces much stronger antibody responses than gene gun delivered DNA or RNA. Um, but after a, a booster immunization, which occurred here at six weeks, you can see that all three of these groups induce comparable antibody responses. And I want to emphasize that the gene gun delivery is about two micrograms of uh, DNA or RNA, whereas the intramuscular replicon RNA is 25 micrograms. Uh, so there's differences in doses as well between these groups. And yet at the end, you can see comparable antibody responses in, uh, with all three of these uh, approaches. Um, so one of the things about gene gun delivery, whether it's DNA or RNA, if you deliver vaccines into the skin, it can induce mucosal immune responses. And we think that might be important for diseases such as influenza or SARS-CoV-2 if you induce immune responses in the mucosal compartment like the lung and they're there at the time of the uh, exposure to the virus, they can potentially provide better protection. So here you can see an example, we use a gene gun, which we sometimes also call PMED, delivering the gene gun into the skin. You can see that in the spleen, we induce comparable T cell responses to electroporation delivery of DNA. But when you look in the lung, it's the gene gun induces much stronger mucosal T cell responses than what you see with electroporation delivery of DNA into the muscle. We don't understand the mechanism why is skin able to induce mucosal responses, whereas muscle delivery not so well. Uh, but there's a number of different mechanisms. One might be that uh, that we've identified is that when uh, antigen presenting cells from the skin go to the draining lymph node, they can potentially license T cells with mucosal homing markers to home to the gut or the lung mucosa. We've also uh, have data suggesting that antigen presenting cells carrying skin derived antigen can potentially directly traffic to these sites, uh, mucosal sites to stimulate immune responses. Um, though regardless, what we do see is a significant effect of inducing mucosal immune responses with a gene gun. Here's a study we did in non-human primates with an influenza uh, DNA vaccine that it was designed to induce T cell responses. What you can see is in these animals, they were vaccinated, the control animals developed a high viremia that was eventually cleared. The vaccinated animals blunted uh, viremia very early, which indicates there was a mucosal T cell response localized in the lung to blunt that initial infection, but also accelerated clearance of the virus. And uh, in fact, when we actually looked at uh, what correlated with protection in these animals, we did see that there was a strong correlation between um, T cell responses localized in the lung and, and uh, re uh, reduced viral loads and accelerated viral clearance. And so, you know, one of the big applications, as I mentioned early in the talk, is that uh, nucleic acid vaccines really offer hope uh, for rapid protection against newly emerging infectious diseases and potentially to protect against the next pandemic. I wanna talk a little bit about that. 
Um, so COVID-19, as you know, is still uh, an ongoing pandemic, although we're starting to get that under control, as you can see here. Uh, and uh, But there's always a threat of a future pandemic. For example, we're hearing a lot about avian influenza spreading in birds, and that's always a risk of potential transmission or spillover event uh, into humans. Um, but there really is a lot of diseases, okay, that actually hold particular uh, uh, potential uh, threat for spillover events in the future and could cause a future pandemic or emerging infectious diseases. And so when we think about really uh, the need for to prepare for the next epidemic or pandemic, and I'm sorry to say this, even as we're getting COVID-19 under control, we need to be prepared for the next one. It's not a mad question of, of when, uh, not a question of if, but, but really when is this going to happen? Um, so, uh, you know, so how could DNA and RNA vaccines potentially protect, prevent the future pandemic? Um, we already know with COVID-19, there's the rapid response approach. Well, we're, uh, we and others are working on ways to make this even quicker. Um, as I mentioned, mRNA and DNA vaccines require only the genetic sequence, so they're very fast to design and produce. But one of the challenges is that can we make them even faster? And so there's a, a goal right now out there to try to streamline development and make a new uh, vaccine from start to deployment within 60 days of identifying a new uh, um, infectious disease that it could emerge as a pandemic. So it, how would this could be, could this be possible? Uh, the idea here is that if you can um, stop uh, develop a vaccine within 60 days, you could stop a, a stop a, an infectious disease even before it becomes a pandemic. And this could be accomplished through a concept called ring vaccination uh, to provide herd immunity. That means you wouldn't have to necessarily vaccinate the entire world to uh, stop the pandemic, but rather you would localize where that pandemic or emerging infectious diseases is, is starting from. And if you can develop a vaccine fast enough, you vaccinate all the people closest to, to that uh, outbreak and that protects uh, even non-vaccinated people outside of that outbreak. And so strategies that we're currently working with in the collaboration with the Department of Defense and GE Global Research, uh, as well as Orlands, is, well, is to get to the 60 days. And so uh, GE actually has developed a strategy to synthetically produce DNA or RNA very quickly. And here they've actually managed to do, produce 5,000 vaccine doses in under three days. And so the idea is that they'd be able to do that and they'd be able to do it synthetically without requiring, say, um, uh, bacteria cells to produce that. If they can do that, then you could actually have potentially um, uh, stations set up all over the world that could very quickly produce uh, this DNA vaccines or RNA vaccines within three days. And then you need a technology such as a gene gun to very quickly uh, be able to vaccinate uh, people around the emerging epidemic or pandemic. So that's that's sort of a pie in the sky concept, but it's it's theoretically possible and it's something that many groups, including ours, are working on. The other way to prevent a future to pandemic is what we called the universal approach. And there's really two different uh, major strategies emerging to, to do this. And one is to develop vaccines um, that could uh, target conserved regions for uh, uh, viruses that are highly variable. So this is really to address things like COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, influenza, and other viruses that are very diverse and they undergo a lot of genetic diversity and can escape the immune response. What we want to do is actually develop vaccines that could target the more conserved sequences within that are conserved among all of these viruses. And if you do that, then you may have an immune response that's capable of protecting and providing broad protection against not only all the variants that are currently existing out there, but future ones that could emerge due to a spillover event. The other way is a what we Called mosaic vaccine. And that's where you would actually incorporate multiple different antigens representing different variants uh, of pandemic concern out there. And that the combination of a, of a certain number of those would together induce uh, antibody responses, not only against what you input into the vaccine, but because there's enough diversity between these also induce broad and cross-reactive antibody responses against other viruses that weren't even included in the mosaic. And that could potentially induce broad immunity. We saw an example of this. There was a paper recently published in Science uh, where they developed an mRNA vaccine encoding 20 different influenza hemagglutinins to pro provide protection against a broad range of influenza viruses that are currently circulating and some that could emerge. Um, and so there are key advantages in this regard for mRNA and DNA vaccines. 
that rapid discovery, we would have to determine what would be the conserved antigens to include in there. And that's really the focus of a lot of research right now. Um, but we can combine multiple antigens into one vaccine. Again, you only need that genetic material. So it's very easy to produce, not uh, imagine producing mRNA or DNA vaccine and coding not just one antigen, but multiple antigens and co-deliver them together. And again, they leverage two uh, types of uh, immune defenses for protection. And then, you know, I just want to kind of emphasize there is a need for universal flu vaccine, but also a coronavirus vaccine. But this is an example of a universal influenza vaccine and why we need that. Current vaccines would really be in inadequate if there was a future influenza pandemic um, because they, they're designed to protect against the match viruses that are circulating. But if that virus undergoes significant genetic changes or we get a spillover event, the current vaccines require six to nine months to manufacture uh, after a new strain is identified. And really in a pandemic, most of the deaths occur within the three to six months. And so these vaccines would be too little and too late. A universal vaccine, its goal would be actually to provide broader immunity in the population. And so currently most of our vaccines are very strain specific, but the goal is to get to a universal influenza vaccine that would offer broader immunity against all types of strains that are out there, not only the ones circulating in humans, but also circulating in animals uh, and could protect us against a spillover, future spillover event. And so this is a concept that we're developing. It's a universal influenza DNA vaccine that's based on conserved sequences. I won't get too much into it, but there's actually three different immunogens here. And one is a stem region of hemagglutinin. The other is a nuclear protein, it's very conserved across all influenza. The strains, and another is uh, includes includes a matrix <clears throat> protein uh, to induce uh, both antibodies as well as T cell responses. Um, and so what we've done in mice is we've shown that it provides broad protection against different representative challenge viruses. Um, but we've also taken this forward into non-human primates. And what we can show is that this DNA vaccine does stimulate broad antibody responses against different influenza representative influenza strains, as well as T cell responses, both CD4 and CD8 responses. And importantly, it induces those mucosal immune responses. And so this is a universal DNA vaccine that was delivered by the gene gun. Um, and what you can see here is that when we challenge these animals with a, uh, a virus that was heterologous, meaning it was different than uh, the, the uh, uh, genetic material that was used for the DNA vaccine, that we see significant protection from clinical disease, and we see a significant protection from uh, reduced temperature as well as reduction in viral load. So this looks like this universal influenza DNA vaccine could protect, potentially protect against uh, different influenza strains, and that's still under development in our lab. So I kind of want to close out this talk with asking the simple question is, can nucleic acid vaccines protect against non-viral pathogens? Because up until now, we've been talking mostly about viruses. And, and uh, that makes sense because really, if you think about it, DNA and RNA vaccines are very effective against viruses because what are viruses? They're all basically DNA and RNA. And so in many respects, DNA and RNA vaccines mimic uh, what the uh, host sees in terms of a virus. Um, there are also evidence that DNA RNA vaccines, there's papers out there show can protect against parasites, for example, malaria, and there's also some bacterial DNA and RNA vaccines are out there. But what about fungi? Okay, so to date, uh, there's no such thing as a fungal vaccine. This is astounding to me. We have vaccines against all these different types of uh, pathogens, but uh, despite there's a lot of fungi out there, to date, there has not been a single vaccine developed for uh, a single fungus. And so I don't know if uh, some of you are uh, into um, uh, The Last of Us or watch that. Uh, there's a, it's a, a movie about fungal infections that could potentially kill. Now, of course, don't worry, that particular fungal infection they're talking about only infects insects. So it's, it, is, it is fictional. Um, but there is really a growing threat for uh, funguses. Uh, uh, in October 2022, the World Health Organization released a global fungal priority list and it announced that really it's a growing threat to human health and that we are very ill-equipped for the dangers of a future uh, fungal, uh, a potential fungal uh, epidemic. Um, and so our lab is actually working uh, towards this. And one uh, example is valley fever. This is a rapidly emerging fungal disease caused by uh, coccidioides uh, that is spreading in the United States due to climate change. Because with the increasing, uh, you know, changes in climate, uh, very wet to dry weather is causing uh, a lot of this fungus lives in the soil and it's spreading throughout the United States. It's predicted by 2030, this um, fungus is going to be a major disease impacting over 50% of the United States. It doesn't impact just, just humans, it also impacts dogs and livestock. Uh, and so recently Congress provided NIH with a mandate to develop a value favor vaccine within the next 10 years. 
But as I mentioned, there's no vaccine for fungus yet. Why is that? Just look at this life cycle here. This is a very complex organism. It is a eukaryote. And there, what, what it precisely and where would we actually target a vaccine to protect against a fungus? This is not a simple answer. We can simply come up with vaccine strategies such as mRNA and DNA, but what would we uh, encode in those mRNA and DNA vaccines? That's still a question that we have to address. And so I just want to cover here just quickly why I think nucleic acid vaccines offer significant hope for protection against not just valley fever, but potentially other fungal diseases. And one is that uh, un really, uh, really talked about uh, thing is that DNA and RNA vaccines actually enable very rapid discovery of new immunogens. And you think about how we discover, uh, identify immunogens to put into vaccines. Traditionally, what you do is you make an expression library of genes from an infectious organism. You isolate those proteins, you inject those into an animal, and then you test whether or not those proteins uh, protect the animal. But this is a very long process. And sometimes those proteins that are produced from these expression libraries are not of the right, correct conformation and don't uh, stimulate uh, uh, protection. What happens with DNA and RNA vaccines, you completely eliminate this bottleneck, this step here, which is a very long process. You go right from the genetic material into the animal, and so you can very quickly accelerate the discovery of new immunogens. And so that's what we're doing right now uh, in terms of trying to discover immunogens to include in a valley fever vaccine. So here we're going to go through a quick, uh, basically, review of what I talked about here in the context of a fungal vaccine, key advantages of DNA and RNA vaccines. Again, only that genetic sequence of an immunogen is required. So you got rapid design and development. It can be designed precisely to focus immune responses only against the antigens needed for protection. It enables rapid discovery of new immunogens. It's highly amenable to multiple antigen delivery. We think that a, a fungal vaccine is going to require co-delivery of multiple antigens to be effective. Uh, it's highly, very safe, very low reactogenicity. It induces T cell responses. This is important. Most of, uh, vaccines are designed to do uh, primarily antibody, but the ability of DNA and RNA vaccines to induce T cell responses may work to their advantages for fungal diseases. And in specifically, they induce these Th1, Th17, CD4 T cell responses, as well as CD8 responses. And studies uh, in natural infection with valley fever and other fungal diseases indicate this might be precisely the types of immune responses that we're going to need to protect against uh, fungal diseases. And so uh, we can actually also co-deliver genetic adjuvants to even drive more robustly uh, these types of immune responses. And finally, we can deliver these to induce mucosal immune responses in the lungs. So this particular fungal disease gets into our bodies through a, a lung infection. Um, and so if we can induce immunity in the lung, that might be more effective. And here's just a, uh, an initial pilot study where we are investigating whether or not a self-amplifying or DNA vaccine encoding uh, known valley fever immunogens could induce immune responses in animals. These are the immunogens we delivered with our DNA vaccine, these genetic adjuvants, which are designed to drive CD8 and TH17 immune responses, as well as mucosal immune responses. We didn't use adjuvants with our self-amplifying RNA vaccine because it's somewhat self-adjuvanting. We immunized mice on uh, day zero, boost them day 28, and sacrificed them to look at both the, uh, at the T cell responses uh, in these animals. And what's striking here is that we saw in all three immunogens, we saw very nice uh, T cell responses, both gamma neutrinos, IL-17, both in the splenocytes, which is systemic, as well as in the lung uh, of these animals. Uh, and what's interesting is that while we have always seen self-amplifying RNA vaccines to be much better than DNA inducing antibody responses, here, when we look at the T cell response, you can see that the DNA vaccine was superior over the self-amplifying RNA vaccine in inducing uh, T cell responses in both the lung and the spleen. So just to emphasize again, that DNA and RNA vaccines uh, can work differently and you know, selecting which one to use for a vaccine will depend on what type of immune response you might need for protection. Uh, and so those animals are now being uh, immunized, a, uh, an additional set of animals, and we'll be looking to see whether or not those immunogens are able to provide some degree of protection. The other thing that we're looking at is really just studying people, non-human primates, because they can get naturally infected with, with uh, valley fever. And we think this might provide insights, further insights into how to design an effective DNA or RNA vaccine for valley fever. We can understand, particularly non-human primates, what are their earliest immune responses to infection. This is very important for vaccine design because you want to get ahead of the infection and stop it before it causes disease. We can also understand what are the mechanisms driving different outcomes in pathogenesis, and that's going to help us to design our vaccine as well. 
And so that's it. And I just want to acknowledge my, my amazing lab and all of the work that they have contributed to, to this work. Uh, biotech companies that I work with, uh, both Orlance and HDT, the Washington National Primate Research Center and the veterinary staff there, Northern Arizona University is working with us in the Valley Fever vaccine, of course, my funding mechanisms. And I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Fuller. That was a wonderful lecture and presentation. We appreciate your time. Very detailed, but also very easy to understand and comprehend, I think. We got five minutes left. We got a hard stop here in just a few minutes. So I just want to start with a few general questions. I had multiple attendees ask for your opinion on a very controversial subject, and that is lipid nanoparticle toxicity, and it's possible as a cause for myocarditis, pericarditis, myocardiopathy, cardiomyopathy. Can you give your opinion on that? Yeah, I, you know, there are some evidence that that the lipid nanoparticles, when they go into our body, they actually distribute uh, in a lot of different sort of organs. And there might be some, uh, because they do cause some sort of inflammation, they might cause transient inflammation associated with that. But there's two things I want to point out with that is one that myocarditis and the kinds of inflammation that you're talking about here um, is actually uh, a more significant threat with COVID-19 infection, okay? Because that causes greater inflammation. And I think that becomes uh, something that a lot of people just don't think about. Oh, well, you know, the vaccine causes a little bit and a small, uh, very, very low risk of that uh, in a certain demographic. That's true. There's always risk with any vaccine that you have, but the risk of getting the infection is far, far greater for that exact same uh, indication. The other thing is I want to emphasize, and I didn't talk about this as much, uh, but the, uh, um, the nanolipid carrier, the line, that HET is developing is being specifically designed so that it actually stays localized at the site of the injection so it doesn't actually distribute all over the body. And there's hope there that that might actually even reduce or eliminate that risk altogether. So there's new lipid nanoparticles being developed for that purpose. Great, great. And related to that, Joseph Ogbedi, if I got your name right, Joseph, asked the question, is there data that actually compares the effectiveness of the more classical lipid nanoparticles to the lipid inorganic nanoparticles? I mean, are the inorganics just as effective? Yeah, there is that actually experiments are going on in progress right now at HCT Bio. And, and unfortunately, I, I can't disclose any of the information right now, but they are doing those comparisons. Um, you know, certainly right now we do have comparisons that, you know, more of the not head to head comparison, but in the clinical trials, the lipid nanoparticle with the self-amplifying RNA vaccine was able to work with only uh, 25 microgram, 10 to 25 microgram doses. This is in contrast to the 100 to, to 30 microgram doses that are currently used with the mRNA vaccines delivered with lipid nanoparticles. So kind of more uh, separate studies, but you can compare them on that, that level. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's exciting. And another very general question, I'm sure you answered this in your talk and we may have missed it, but several of us were wondering, why is it that, at least for COVID-19, the mRNA platform is just more effective than DNA? So like Moderna and Pfizer's platform just works better than like Sinovac's DNA-based platform in China. Yeah, this is, so Sinovac is actually an inactivated vaccine uh, from China. And so it's a whole different class of vaccine, but the, the other one is the, um, the one that was uh, licensed for use in India, that is a DNA vaccine. And so a uh, couple of different things to emphasize there is that the uh, the mRNA vaccines, as some of our data shown, is very, very effective in inducing antibody responses. And for SARS-CoV-2, the primary mechanism of protection is that antibody response. And so DNA vaccines can, as we saw in our studies with non-human primates, with multiple doses can get to the level of antibody that you see uh, RNA vaccines capable of doing, but RNA vaccines can induce those much more quickly simply because they're more immunogenic. Why is that? RNA is naturally sensed in our cells uh, as sort of a, a little bit of a danger signal. And so it causes, it actually induces an innate immune pathway immediately in those cells to trigger those immune responses. Now, the DNA vaccine licensed for use in India was just naked DNA with no adjuvants. And I think in the future, what we're looking at is if you can co-formulate additional plasmas, DNA vaccines that can help trigger and, and, and um, recruit those innate immune responses, you're gonna get them closer and closer to the immunogenicity of mRNA vaccines. If we do that, that could be really exciting because DNA vaccines that I mentioned are much more stable. Sounds good, appreciate that. And I think I'll try to get to one other question here. I know we got one minute left. So this question is from Khalid Dewan. And the question is, why is it that mRNA vaccines really just induce a, a short duration of immunity, like four to six months? Why isn't it longer than that? 
Yeah, so here's a very important question because it, it really stems from the type of disease that we're talking about. mRNA vaccines actually induce very, very long-term memory, okay? And what we're trying to compare here is that the reason why the immunity seems short is because the disease, the virus causes disease very, very quickly. So when you have uh, get vaccinated, you develop a memory immune response. And generally, when you get exposed to a pathogen, it would take seven to 10 days for a recall response. Those memory recall become to the full potency and protect you against that disease. So if you think of things like, for example, uh, some of those other sorts of viruses like polio takes a while, it incubates a while before it causes disease. So you have a window of time, seven to 10 days for that recall response to come up and shut that disease down virus down before it causes disease. Because COVID-19 causes disease within three to five days after exposure, it's too soon. So the memory response is still trying to come back up. It's still good enough in the sense that it comes up enough that it actually can shut down the virus, but you might get sick for a little bit. So it seems like the yeah. immunity is short, but actually it's long-term memory. And it's just, uh, you know, for something that causes disease very quickly, what you need is sustained circulating, a certain level of sustained circulating antibody to completely prevent the infection long-term. So that's, for example, our tetanus vaccine. If you get tetanus, you're going to get disease within hours, right? And so you have to have circulating levels of antibody. You have to constantly boost those antibodies to keep them sustained. So it has a lot to do with the disease, the nature of the disease. Not so much that mRNA vaccines are worse than any other vaccine in inducing immune memory. It's just that SARS-CoV-2 is a very causes disease very quickly. That's very interesting. The symptoms pop up before the immune response can take effect. Yeah, before the recall can come. But you still have memory immunity. And even if you have waned immune responses and you get exposed to it, you're still better off uh, because uh, that immune memory will come back and start to combat that virus much more quickly than if you didn't have that immune memory. And so it still will accelerate clearance of the infection, but you might still get sick uh, if you didn't have a recent booster immunization to get those antibody titers up high. Thanks for that. So with that, I apologize to everybody else. We literally have 115 new chats uh, questions that I didn't get to. Apologize to y'all. We'll get a transcript of this and try to get a, uh, a lot of those answered by Dr. Fuller. Let me just quickly thank all the attendees. We had by far our largest turnout ever for BioTalk Tuesday, over 400 attendees today. I have to run through the countries worldwide that everybody uh, attended from, of course, the USA, across the US. We also had Egypt, Malaysia, Canada, Uganda, England, Ghana, Saudi Arabia, Albania, Brazil, Russia, Israel, UAE, Turkey, Mexico, Ireland, El Salvador, Bangladesh, Spain, Switzerland, Brazil, Trinidad and Tobago, Iran, Kenya, Nigeria, Colombia, Pakistan, Italy, Argentina, Iraq, Peru, Greece, Germany, Romania, India, and Burkas Faso. So what a wonderful turnout. We appreciate all you attendees. Thanks for breaking the record there. Certainly, Dr. Fuller, thank you. That was a fantastic seminar. Uh, really enjoyed it. And congrats to you and all your success, both in academia and in industry and with your research. It's very inspiring to all of us. So. Well, thanks for having me. It's been my honor to be able to talk to all of you. And uh, I really, really enjoyed uh, giving this talk today. And I will be happy to answer questions uh, if you provide me a transcript. Great. We'll work on that offline. And one more thank you that goes out to my colleague and good friend, Christine Lay at Sinobiological, who organized this talk. Christine, we appreciate your efforts. And with that, we'll sign off and I bid everybody a good afternoon or good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.